space is big, really big. You just won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-boggling big it is. I mean, you may think it's a long way down the road to the chemists, but that's just peanuts to space. So says the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It is a pretty big universe. The Earth becomes tiny within the solar system, which itself becomes insignificant within the local group of solar systems. You zoom out to the Milky Way, zoom out, zoom out exponentially every time until you reach the observable universe so far. So people think it's a, an enormous universe, and they're right, it is. But you know what isn't enormous? That tiny blue dot. It's very often said that it's a small world. You bump into people you know when you're walking around town. In a conversation with a stranger, you'll discover that you share a mutual acquaintance, and one of you goes, it's a small world. Sometimes when you're somewhere unexpected, like on holiday, you bump into somebody you know, and that's when you discover it's an inconveniently small world. Because as rare as these things are, they do happen. So here we are, on our small world, spinning through the cosmos, sending satellites into space like it's going out of fashion, which we should maybe start hoping it does, because in 50 years of space activity, we have put some incredible, amazing feats of engineering and science into orbit. But all too often, those have then gone on to become just another piece of junk orbiting the planet. I want to talk a little bit about something called Kessler Syndrome. Kessler Syndrome was proposed by a NASA scientist in 1978. Now, the crossing the Rubicon is the theme of today's talk. We know that means passing the point of no return. The difference between then and now is that when we talk about crossing the Rubicon, Caesar and his army knew exactly what they were going for. They knew what the implications of crossing were. They knew what the prize for success was. They knew what the price for failure was. Most of us who are not involved with space debris have arrived at the banks of the Rubicon unaware of the hazards that we face. So Kessler proposed that we were putting so many objects into orbit that there would come a critical moment where a collision would be inevitable. And you might wonder, is that so bad? What's, what's the big deal? Well, if you look at this, this was an impact of the window pane of a shuttle caused by a piece of debris. In this case, a fleck of paint traveling at hypervelocity, which managed to cause this much damage. There are 18,000 pieces of catalogued space debris in low Earth orbit being tracked. There are thousands, hundreds of thousands more, smaller, with a diameter bigger than one centimeter. Debris ranges from the enormous entire satellites like the European Space Agency's ENDYSAT, which stopped responding to signals now orbits the planet in control, to the tiny, there are millions more even, smaller particles, fragments, too tiny to be tracked, still capable of causing enormous damage. So Kessler Syndrome says that when the first collision between two satellites occurs, that creates clouds of debris, that debris goes on to impact other objects, which creates more debris, it's sent off a chain reaction, a cascade of it that we call Kessler syndrome. The question you maybe want to think about today is, has this already begun? And if you speak to scientists and researchers working in the field of space debris, some of them will tell you that it has begun. And some of them will point to 2019, for the first time ever, there was an accidental hypervelocity collision between two satellites, Ariane 33, the private building telecom satellite, and Cosmos 2251, a uh, defunct military communication satellite, it collided at a speed, relative speed of 11 kilometers per second, and resulted in two clouds of debris traveling around the planet in orbit at enormous speeds, capable of enormous damage. And the scary thing is that it wasn't even on the list of the 100 most likely collisions for that day. The International Space Station has to take evasive action from time to time to avoid debris. Sometimes the astronauts aboard have to clamber into one of their capsules and wait. Am I trying to be frightened? Am I exaggerating? No and no. The trouble we're talking about space is we're talking about things on a scale that most of us are unfamiliar with. So facts can sound like hyperbole. 
I'm not here to sensationalize this. I'm here to highlight the risks, yes, but to create awareness and to engage. I work on a project called Stardust, based in Strathclyde University. Now, one of the main goals of Stardust is to mitigate space debris. And some of the researchers from the network are working in universities and companies and institutions and observatories throughout Europe. The idea is that we take multiple disciplines and integrate them from robotics to applied mathematics, from computational intelligence to astrodynamics, to try and find practical effective solutions to the problems of space debris and asteroids. Now, that's what makes Sardas quite so innovative and exciting. Because nobody else is studying these two things in tandem, using what they learn from one to apply it to the other and vice versa. Theoretical physicists, applied mathematicians and engineers don't usually make from natural bedfellows, but it's this bringing together of expertise, the cross-pollination of research, ideas, methodology and experience that can create conditions where uh, an inspirational spark can fire the creative engines. Students from the Scottish Space School came to visit Strathclyde University recently. They had a workshop with some of the researchers from Stardust, and they were asked to come up with ideas, new ways to tackle the space debris. One of my favourites was a space whale, a giant robotic whale which would sail around orbit, swallowing up debris, which sounds far fetched on the face of it. But it's that kind of imagination which can lead to a conversation, which leads to an idea, which leads to a theme, which leads to a practical solution. Some of the researchers at Stardust are looking at space-borne lasers. Now there are other researchers, other projects looking at different things. Space nets, space pickup trucks, earth-based space laser brooms, tractor beams, suborbital balloon platform, air pulse cannons, all of a sudden a space wheel doesn't sound quite so outlandish as it did a minute ago. But let's talk lasers, you put a laser on a satellite, you put it into orbit and you fire the laser, that piece of debris, long enough to heat it up to the point where you create a vaporization outflow which causes in reaction thrust. In theory allowing you to divert the piece of debris wherever you need or want it to go. This is a massive oversimplification of some incredibly involved in complex science. If anybody is tearing their hair out, they're probably an engineer. It's not the difficulty or the complexity of the research that holds us back from clearing the orbit. It's the lack of implementation of this research. At some point, people need to get together, take decisive action, and put this research into practice. The quickest way across the Rubicon is telling yourself that you'll cross that bridge when you come to it. Now, there's a limited amount of time to deal with this issue. This will snowball. Remember, the Kessler syndrome is a cascade event. And rules governing the end of useful lives of new satellites, whether that's to burn them up in a controlled re-entry, whether it's to park them in a safe graveyard orbit, do not address the current existing catalogue of debris above our heads. What's the big deal? Why do we need access to orbit? Well, it's pretty obvious. Phones, television, internet, navigation, weather, climate, environmental monitoring. But there's another good reason why we want to keep our access to space free and unhindered. I'll give you a clue what it is. I don't want to close my eyes. I don't want to fall asleep because I'd miss you, baby. And I don't want to miss a thing. That's right. How are we going to get Bruce Willis into space to save our asses from an asteroid if we can't launch anything into space without it being damaged on the way up? But I hear many of you wonder to yourselves why. What are the actual odds of us being hit by an asteroid? Well, if you're new to the conversation, as I am, you'll see that it's not unusual for the Earth to have asteroids burn up in its orbit. That's a surprisingly large number to me. I was, I was surprised. What are the odds? Well, they're about the same as they were for the dinosaurs the day before they could 
hit by an asteroid 65 million years ago. And I said I wanted to avoid it carefully, I know. But in 2013, in the skies over a small Russian town called Chelyabinsk, an asteroid, a meteor came through the atmosphere, exploded high up in the sky, with a force of a couple of Hiroshima bombs, you know, no big deal. It exploded high up, high up enough that the damage was caused mainly to buildings and blew out a few, wind, few windows. Engines mainly caused by flying glass, but we were lucky that it didn't explode lower down or over a bigger city. You see here that the bigger the asteroid, the longer the time between impacts, statistically speaking, the less likely we are to experience that, which is good. Chelyabinsk is the small one there, a fireball, shockwave, minor damage, great. Now, interestingly enough, when Chelyabinsk arrived, most keen stargazers were looking on the other side of the planet. They didn't see Chelyabinsk coming, not because they weren't looking, but because it came from the sun side, we were blinded. We didn't see it. They were looking at another object of similar mass, similar size, that was flying by. It flew by 16 hours later, very close to the Earth. <coughs> 100 to 200 years, we can expect a Chilean sleep event and two fly by in the same day. But when you're on a timeline of millions and billions of years, 300 years, 10,000, what's the difference? These are minor statistical variations. They don't affect that graph. So, when you have the Sun in the middle of Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, the big ones, Jupiter, we're getting better at spotting asteroids. It's so unlikely, and I want to stress that, that an extinction type asteroid could come close and do, do any damage anytime soon. It's so unlikely, it's not, it's not going to happen. But a smaller, Chile this type of thing, it could cause localised damage on a city scale. That's something we need to think about and that's something we need to be ready for. In an ideal world where the skies above our head are free from man-made debris, we get better and better at spotting asteroids and we are getting better. One big question remains, will we be able to deflect an asteroid which threatens lives? Arthur C. Clarke quotes Larry Niven as saying, the dinosaurs became extinct because they didn't have a space program. And if we become extinct because we don't have a space program, it'll serve us right. In the film Armageddon, we had 18 days to save the world. They managed to equip, prepare two shuttles, source a team of oil rig workers, train them to be astronauts, send them into space, blow up an asteroid, come back for a glass of bubble. It was fantastic. Realistically speaking, if we saw something like that with 18 days to spare before the point of no return, we would be toast. But realistically, if we're talking realistically, Armageddon probably shouldn't be part of the conversation. Ten years is probably what we want if we want to carry out a mission like that. Less than that, the chances of failure start to increase. Now, look at Rosetta. European Space Agency's mission. Look at the upcoming NASA Osiris Rex mission. Ten years for the mission, not counting planning and preparation time. Now, if you look at, it, I think we can agree that we want the skies above our heads to remain free and unfettered. Our access to space is prerequisite. Who's leading the way? Who's providing the vision? Well, if you look at the Rosetta mission again, look at the television coverage of it, you see an inspirational mix of women and men, of all cultures, of all ages, working together towards a common goal, working beyond national and military interests, and working beyond corporate profit lines. 20 years from conception to planning to implementation, governments came and went. That was a success for humanity. That's the model that we need to emulate if we are to avoid the point of no return. A lot of my focus with Stardust is in public engagement and outreach communication. That is how we're going to accomplish this. We need more space whales. We need to engage and communicate. Now, asteroids and space debris are two incredibly captivating subjects. I know because I'm a newcomer to the subject and I'm hooked. When I speak to my friends and family, I talk about it ad nauseam. Sometimes I talk to entire rooms full of people. I talk to my nephew and nieces, and they are awestruck and full of questions. 
We've got a pilot project coming up at the end of this month where schools will come in, we'll talk to them about the asteroid side of what we're doing, and they will take that back to try and implement it in line with the curriculum. Real research, the kind that can get you hooked in classrooms, and whether those students go on to study STEM, science, technology, engineering, and maths, or whether they go on to become policy centers, or whether they go on to an entirely different future, if they do it with information, an informed mind, and a vote in the pocket, we will have increased our chances of survival in the long term. And we'll have taken a big step away from ever having to say, it serves us right. Because all of our eggs are in one basket here. This world is precious, it's vulnerable, and it's small. Thank you very much.